Okay. All right. Um, welcome to the webinar for 2017 Applications to Instrumental Access. Uh, my name is Christina Viola Servastava. I am the Metrics and Evaluation Manager here at Seeding Labs. And I'm Melissa Wu. I'm the Global Partnerships Director at Seeding Labs. And together we run the application process and we also serve as the primary points of contact for the application process. Um, during the webinar today, we invite you to ask questions throughout. Um, if you have questions, please email us at application at seedinglabs.org. We that account live and do our best to address your questions as we receive them. In the recorded version of this webinar, please also feel free to send us questions uh, to application at seedinglabs.org and we will answer them as soon as we can. Okay, so let's start the webinar. Okay. Uh, so, Seeding Labs was established as a US based uh, 501c3 uh, nonprofit NGO in 2008. Our mission is to build a world where all scientists can make life changing discoveries because, as everyone watching this webinar almost certainly knows, scientific talent is everywhere, but resources are not. Uh, instrumental Access is Seeding Labs' flagship program. The goal of the program is to make affordable, high-quality laboratory equipment available to universities in developing countries. We have shipped 143 tons of equipment uh, worth 4.9 million US dollars, um, and that value is the fair market value that we calculate for tax purposes. So that's what the equipment would have been worth on the used market. Uh, to, the replacement cost for equivalent new equipment would usually be up to four times higher. We've shipped so far to 49 partners in 28 countries, uh, and we're just getting started. 2016 was our biggest year ever by far with 14 shipments completed, and we expect to do at least that many in 2017 and 2018. All right, uh, let me give you an overview of the process of how instrumental access works. Uh, the process starts with equipment donations, which we actively solicit. Uh, equipment comes from manufacturers, um, and the other half comes from end users, such as pharmaceutical companies. Uh, the equipment and glassware we receive can be new or gently used. Consumables that we accept are always in full, unopened cases. We're very careful about what we accept as donations. We look for surplus equipment that's likely to be of use in biology and chemistry or labs or related fields. We do not accept equipment that is broken, obsolete, or so highly customized that it couldn't easily be repurposed in another lab. The donated equipment comes to our warehouse here in Boston, where we inventory it and do functional testing as feasible in a warehouse setting. We run an annual application process to select our partners, and we'll say more about the details of the review and vetting process uh, later in the webinar. Once we select our partners, accepted participants are assigned a window for equipment selection. We have an electronic shopping cart, and when it's your turn, you can select items from our inventory uh, to build a shipment that meets your institution's needs a little bit more about what goes into a shipment in a few minutes. Once equipment selection is complete, we invoice for the program fee, and as soon as we receive payment, the shipment is packed into a 20-foot shipping container, and we schedule the shipment. We work with our partners to make sure that we're complying with all relevant re customs regulations before and after shipping. For example, a few countries require a free inspection before the container is loaded, and there are some other country-specific requirements. We ship to the nearest seaport uh, with some flexibility if there's a compelling reason to ship somewhere else. Time in transit ranges from a few weeks to three months, uh, depending on distance and sailing schedules. Our partners are responsible for customs clearance uh, on their end as well as transportation of the equipment from the port to your institution. 
And then partners are also responsible for installation and use of the equipment. All right, let me speak a little bit about eligibility. The first criterion for eligibility is that partners must be based in a lower middle income country using World Bank classifications. Uh, there's also a short list of excluded countries where we are unable to work due to legal or logistical hurdles. Um, they're listed on the slide. Our second criterion uh, describes institution type. Eligibility is limited to academic departments at low and middle income country universities or other institutions of higher education. Uh, we also accept applications from university affiliated research institutes as well as publicly funded research institutes uh, that are substantively involved in training students. Within a university, we prefer to partner at the level of the academic departments, but we are willing to consider other uh, university subunits such as schools or faculties if there's a compelling reason to do so. Um, if this situation applies to you, please email us uh, and we can discuss it. Uh, we do not have specific requirements for academic discipline, uh, except to say that your department or institution must have sufficient need for the items in our inventory, um, which is almost exclusively intended for use in biology and chemistry labs. The program is not generally a good fit for physics departments, computer science departments, and many engineering departments, except for those that are closely allied with biology and chemistry. Uh, and because we are asked frequently, uh, we have a list of types of, types of organizations who are not eligible. We do not accept applications from individuals, from for-profit companies, from institutions that are not based in low and middle income countries. We do not accept applications from medical clinics or hospitals. Um, the one exception would be an academic research department based at a teaching hospital would likely be eligible. And we don't accept applications from primary or secondary schools. And if you have any questions at all about eligibility, we strongly encourage you to contact us. Uh, the email address is application at seedinglabs.org. And please do this before you apply, um, because we do know that our application takes quite a bit of effort, and we don't want any of that effort to be wasted um, if you turn out not to be eligible. All right, um, I will talk a little bit about the timeline for this year's program. Uh, the application portal will be open from April to July. Uh, the deadline for submission of applications is the 28th of July. Uh, if you followed this process last year, you'll know that we extended that deadline into August. Uh, we will almost certainly not be doing that again this year because we're on a tighter timeline. Um, so, so please don't go into it expecting that that won't be the deadline. Uh, from August to November, we conduct internal ex and external review, um, interviews with our top scoring applicants, and we select our final partners. We expect to make notifications of awards in December of 2017 this year. Uh, and at the beginning of 2018, we will be holding detailed discussions of equipment needs. Uh, we'll be asking our partners to sign a letter of agreement and complete a background survey. And then from the beginning of 2018 through 2019, we'll be scheduling our equipment selection windows um, and making shipments. We just want to we want to we want to remember to pause. Um, please, if you have any questions at all now or throughout the rest of the webinar, email us at application at email at seedinglabs.org. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, more about what shipments look like. Um, here you have actually a picture of a shipment that went to the University of the Philippines, uh, Dilema. So as Christina mentioned, you'll have um, for participants who are selected, we'll have a period of time that we call the equipment selection window to select from our available inventory. Um, in terms of value, on average, 
Universities have selected equipment and consumables that are valued between 60K and 150K, fair market value in USD. Um, as Christina mentioned before, that means the used market here in the US. We estimate that uh, a university would spend between 230K and 500,000 to obtain similar equipment outside of our program. Um, there are only a, a couple of constraints that we put on the selection. One is that all of the equipment must fit in a standard 20-foot shipping container. Um, a shipping container is approximately six meters deep. Um, in addition, we have additional guidelines to prevent any one participant from taking all of the most valuable or scarcest items. This is what we call the point system. In this system, each piece of equipment is given a points value based on seating labs supply and demand. All of the universities are given the same maximum number of points. Um, okay. So to give you a little bit more detail about what kinds of things could go into a shipment, um, we have sample an example shipment here. Um, as we discussed already, and we really want to emphasize, most of the equipment in our, in our inventory is specialized for those doing research related to chemistry or biology. Within those sets, though, we do have a variety of different kinds of equipment, from chromatographs to balances to pipetters, various kinds of consumables like gloves, tubes, dishes, and many types of glassware. Although our inventory fluctuates, participants can expect during their selection window to see a large subset of these types of equipment. Again, what we've put here is one example of shipment. Um, if you have questions on whether you can expect that your equipment needs can be satisfied through our program, please email us at application at seedinglabs.org. You can also refer to our webpage to see typical types of equipment distributed through this program, and the link there is on the bottom of the slide. In addition, there are on our website a few other example shipments. Okay, so um, participation in instrumental access is very economical. Uh, participating departments pay a program fee that helps defray the cost of um, the cost that seating labs bears. This fee is adjusted to the income level of the country where your university is located. As you may remember from the previous slide, these fees are just a fraction of the cost of purchasing the equipment either new or even off the used equipment market. Um, what the fee covers is seating lab services for administering instrumental access our cost of equipment procurement, storage, handling, and the cost of shipping equipment from door to port by ocean freight. The university would be responsible for any fees associated with foreign exchange and finances, clearing customs, and transporting the equipment from the port to your university. In addition, you would be responsible for any costs associated with installing and using the equipment, um, for example, purchase of electrical adapters, transformers, and frequency converters. Um, we should note that most of the equipment does come from the U.S. and it's 120 volts, 60 hertz. If that's not your power grid where you are, you will most likely need to purchase transformers. Um, in addition, you may need to purchase software, reagents, accessories, and pay for the installation, calibration, operation, maintenance, and repair of the equipment on an ongoing basis. All right, again, any questions on equipment or shipments or anything else that we discussed during this webinar, please email us. All right, um, I will talk a little bit about our review process. It consists of three steps. Um, first, our seating lab staff read every application. Uh, what we're reading for is eligibility, suitability for the program, as well as overall quality. 
Uh, we typically send the top two-thirds of applications on to external review. So the second phase is external review. We, uh, each application is read by at least three external reviewers, uh, and often more. Our reviewers are all volunteers. Most are research scientists, uh, but a few are experts in international development. Each application a score according to three criteria. The first is the, the case you've made for needing equipment. The second is likelihood of productive use of the equipment. And the third is potential impact of use of the equipment. Uh, the top scoring candidates coming out of external review are then invited to participate in an interview via Skype or phone. Uh, during these interviews, we may ask a few follow-up questions about your application, if we have any, uh, but the bulk of the interviews are two-way conversations about the details of program participation, uh, what would be required of you, and how you would benefit from participation. We do ask that the university vice chancellor or an equivalent uh, university official uh, or institution official uh, participate in the first few minutes of the interview uh, in order to confirm that the administration of the institution is supportive of the application. All right, um, what are we looking for in an application? Uh, first, we're looking for partners where additional equipment will unlock potential and generate impact. Uh, we're looking for places where lack of equipment is a barrier to achieving specific research uh, and or educational objectives. We're looking for partners who have sufficient knowledge, infrastructure, and supporting resources uh, to make the proposed use feasible. So we're not necessarily looking for the places that have the most existing infrastructure, but we're looking for places that can support uh, what you have proposed to do. And finally, we're looking for places where use of equipment could positively impact the university, the local community, uh, and or the world. The second thing we're looking for are partners that, who are willing and able to collaborate effectively on the shipment and in future obligations with seeding labs. So we're looking for places where there is strong institutional and departmental support. We're looking for places where there's a clear and detailed plan to distribute, install, maintain, and use the equipment. And we're looking for groups uh, who will be responsive and able to meet deadlines before and after the shipment, included, including all required follow-up reporting. All right, we also have a few tips for potential applicants. Uh, first and most importantly, uh, the, the most important tip we can give you is to answer all of the questions, including all of the subparts, as completely as possible. Uh, please keep in mind that the application process is very competitive. In the past few years, we've received five to six applications for every available slot. Uh, <laughs> this maybe goes without saying. But we've asked every question on the application for a reason. Uh, and if we didn't want a substantive answer, we, we wouldn't have included it in the application. Uh, if you do have an existing relationship with Seeding Labs, you are welcome to reapply. Uh, but just please remember that you're going to be evaluated by external reviewers who don't necessarily know you. Um, so answer all of the questions completely and don't assume that we already have information. Um, a second tip would be to include as much detail as possible. You really can't give us too many examples. Uh, bear in mind that most of our application, most of our applicants tell stories that are similar in broad outlines, but the ones that end up standing out are the ones that give us a really strong sense of why the individual applicant is uniquely suited to benefit from our program. Uh, some other tips, it's important to make sure your application tells a consistent story. So it's a red flag for us if the case for need and equipment uh, that you're requesting and use proposals don't all match and mutually support each other. 
you should not focus your entire application around a single instrument, um, and especially not something like a DNA sequencer or a mass spec that's extremely difficult for us to get. What we're looking for are departments and institutions who can make optimal use of what we have to offer, which is an entire container full of equipment, not just one item. We do do our best to meet everyone's top priority needs, uh, but there are no guarantees. Uh, and finally, we recommend that you have a colleague review your application, and please contact us if you have any questions. We're, we're happy to, to answer all questions. And the address again is application at seedinglabs.org. And finally, a little bit about how to apply. Uh, applications are typically submitted by a faculty member or department head on behalf of the department. Applications must be in English, and applications must be submitted using our online application portal. Um, and we put the link on the slide. It's also in the RFA. Uh, but we cannot accept applications via email or, or any other way. Uh, please do note that the application portal requires a current version of Chrome, Firefox, Safari, or Internet Explorer, those browsers only. Uh, we've been warned that use of any other browser may cause you to lose data. All right, one more time. The, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> The email address for any questions is application at seedinglabs.org. All right, so now what we're going to do is I'll go through how to um, log into our portal, how to create a new account. Um, once you're in there, how you can navigate through the application form, um, options for working offline and returning to a saved application, and lastly, um, how to submit the application. Okay, so perfect. All right, so we've already navigated to the website, the link that Christina had posted before. If you were a previous applicant um, who has used this portal before, uh, you can log in with the email address and password that you've used previously. Um, if you don't remember your email address, that you used, you can send us an email and we'll look up and see what account information we have for you. Um, if you do remember your email address but you forgot your password, you can use the forgot your password link. Now for those of you who haven't used this portal before, you'll have to create a new account and there's a button, the gray button that says create new account. Um, the first thing that you'll have to do is enter in your institution name and department. And we ask you to please enter it in in the same format that we've requested, um, that format being institution name, hyphen, and then what your applicant department is. Um, after you do that, there's a little bit more information asked here, which is the city and country. Um, once you enter that in, you can click Next in the blue button. All right. Then, um, please enter in your personal contact information. Uh, anything that has an asterisk after it, for example, salutation, first name, last name, you have to enter that in, or you'll get a little pop-up that tells you to enter it in. Um, and here you'll have an option to enter in the email. Um, again, this email is what you'll be using as your login. And we will communicate with you through this email address. So um, please keep both of those in mind. All right. To speed things up, obviously Christine is not entering in actual places. We'll see which one of these. Accepted. All right, great. So then you can choose a password. Please use something that you will remember. Um, and as you just saw in the pop-up, it has to be six characters at least. Once you're all set with that, you can create an account. Um, at this point, you can choose to receive a test email from the system. 
Um, this is a good way to check and make sure you didn't have any typos in your email address. So um, once you do that, you can check your email. Um, once you receive the email, you can check, I've received this email. Or you can also continue without checking um, whether you've received the email. And with that, that is your account creation. Uh, now what you see here is the inside of our application portal. Um, if Again, if you had um, an account last year, when you log in, this is the first thing that you'll see. So from those of you from last year, you'll know a little bit of changes from last year. The navigation bar has just moved to the top instead of the side. So to apply, the first thing that you'll need to do is click apply uh, in the blue button. Okay, once you're here, you'll see the whole application. Um, there are sections. You can see that's the first section, introduction. Now we're passing through background information. You can open and close each section by clicking on the arrow. So this way you can, if you want, you can um, you know, easily jump to different sections within the application. Um, as you're working on the application, you'll see fields that you'll need to enter in information. Again, fields with stars in them are required. Uh, fields without stars are not required, but we, you know, if those questions are relevant to you, we highly recommend that you answer them. Um, as you're working through, you want to periodically save your application. At the very bottom, there is a link to save the application, or sorry, a button to save the application. So you can see that button in gray on the bottom right. Now, if you want to work offline, um, you can do that. If you go back to the top of the application, you'll see uh, some buttons. The question list um, shows you the list of questions and um, and you can, or it, it gives you a document that you can download of all the questions. So you can use that questions and generate a draft offline um, for, um, for seeing what the questions are and being able to work offline. Um, all right, and once you've actually entered in some answers to uh, the application and save them, you'll see a new button pop up at the top, which is called Application Packet. This button will export the questions as well as the answers that you've um, put in so far. So you can double check and read offline, make edits um, offline for, you know, for what you've written so far. All right, now the last thing is once you're ready, um, you can submit the application. by clicking the blue button. Now, once you do that, the application does go to Seeding Labs. If for any reason you've accidentally clicked Submit Application and you didn't actually mean to click it, um, you meant to click Save or something else, just send us an email and we can revert the application back to a draft form so that you can work on it. Now, one last thing. Um, is returning to your application after you've started one. Um, so to go back to the home page, um, for the home page, make sure you click on the home and not the Seating Labs icon. That will actually bring us bring you to our web page and not the home of the grant application. For that, click on the home button. So if you have started an application and you are returning to continue work on your application, make sure to click on edit application and not the apply button up here. If you click on that once you've already started an application, it will start another draft of the application. So if you've started and saved an application, make sure when you re-log in to go to 
edit application to continue working on that same application. Okay. Um, all right, so I think that's everything within the portal. And, all right, and as we said before, if you have any questions, um, send us an email. You can see the whole request for applications, all of the application details, um, a little bit more information on some of the information that we talked about today at the link seedinglabs.org slash RFA2017. Um, and we'll check for any questions. Sure. Why don't we, uh, while we're waiting for questions to come in, because there is a little bit of a time delay in the broadcast, uh, why don't we answer some questions that we are asked frequently? Uh, one question that we get asked all the time is regarding, uh, for the purpose of customs and import regulations, uh, will the equipment be considered a donation and will it be necessary to pay import duties? Uh, this is a question that we can't really answer specifically because customs and import regulations vary widely by country. Uh, what we can promise is that we will provide documentation to demonstrate to local authorities that the shipment is a donation, uh, including an invoice showing that the equipment is a donation, all of the fees that we charge are for our services, uh, as well as a donation letter. Uh, we can also work with you uh, as we need to, to meet other uh, regulations. Um, if your university has a procurement office, we highly recommend that you uh, consult with them for more specific advice about the regulations that apply in your particular area. And actually, talking about um, talking to the procurement office, uh, we would recommend, as part of this application, that you do talk to a number of offices within your institution. Um, obviously, we've asked for institutional support. There is a request for a letter of support from the BC, um, as well as for uh, you know the top candidates that get to get to the vetting stage um, or interview stage. A request that the BC comes to that meeting. Um, in addition, it would be helpful to talk to the procurement office so that they can understand what this program would look like at your institution um, and talk with anyone who might be involved in budgeting um, and taking a look at all of the costs of the program as a whole. Uh, so yes, we, we really recommend that you talk to uh, as many people as you can to make a strong application. Um, okay. Now, another question related to equipment is, can Seating Labs share a list of the equipment that's currently available? Um, the answer to that is no. Um, we do not provide lists of equipment that's currently available because our inventory fluctuates very frequently. Um, as equipment donations to us are received and shipments to our program participants go out. Um, so in our point of view, or what happens in actuality, what we have on hand right at this moment is not the same as what will be available um, next week, next month, or next year. So we cannot provide you a list of what's available. However, there are two things that we can do. One, again, is the website link we provided you of common uh, types of equipment provided through this program. As well, if you have concerns about or questions about specific pieces of equipment um, and you want an educated guess on how likely it is that we would have that equipment in our inventory, uh, please contact us with that and we'll give you an estimate. Again, it's not a guarantee, but we can tell you, oh, this instrument's something that we get all the time, we're pretty confident it would be available, versus uh, that other instrument is something that we've never gotten before, and chances are low that we would get one. 
All right, uh, another question that we're asked frequently is where the equipment comes from and what condition you can expect it to be in. Uh, to answer the first part, surplus equipment is donated to seeding labs from a variety of sources. These include manufacturers and end users. Uh, equipment from manufacturers is generally brand new. Um, equipment from end users is generally used. Uh, we work with our donors to obtain high quality equipment to meet your needs. Uh, in terms of condition, the equipment and glassware in our inventory can be new or gently used. Uh, consumables are always in full unopened case cases. We do not accept items that are obsolete or customized to the extent that they could not easily be repurposed. Uh, we work with our donors closely to verify that all of the items that we accept are fully functional uh, at the time of donation. And we also perform functional tests on equipment as feasible in our warehouse. Uh, please note, however, that uh, some items cannot effectively be tested in a warehouse setting. And that includes most of the most sophisticated instruments where you, you, you would need a sample and calibration and all that to, to effectively test them. Okay. okay, so we don't see any other questions at this time. Um, so I think we'll close the webinar, of course. You are welcome to email us. We highly encourage you to send us any questions that you have. Um, Please don't hesitate uh, to contact us about anything. We, we enjoy having some interaction, <laughs> and no question is, is too silly. Um, so please, we would much rather that you asked us than that you don't. Yeah. Um, our ultimate goal is to have a strong, you know, to identify a strong group of uh, partners to work with, um, and we don't want questions about the application to um, be a barrier for demonstrating um, demonstrating who you are. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us, and I look forward to uh, hearing from you in our email or in your application. <laughs>